Here's a rule of thumb, compound lifts always before isolation lifts, except when it's hard for you to connect to a particular muscle. In that case, isolation before compound will help you connect to a tough to connect to muscle. So I love let's, let's simplify yeah let's simplify that for I love rules. I love breaking them yeah uh, so so when you look at workout programming good workout programming you almost always want to start with compound lifts compound lifts uh, are referred to as compound because they use more than one joint so like a bench press an overhead press a row a squat those would all be all considered um, compound it's isolation require the most energy they require the most energy they use the most muscles they give you the most bang for your buck. Like, you know, three sets of squats does the work of like five or six other exercises, okay? So typically you want to do them first when you're strongest. They send the loudest muscle building signal. And this is generally true. However, there are cases where or times where this is a rule that you can break. And one of the best times to break this rule is when you have a particular muscle that you have trouble connecting to. For example, let's say uh, you have a tough time feeling your butt uh, when you do any type of lower body exercise. In this case, it might be okay to start with an isolation butt exercise and then go to squats or then go to front squats or lunges because that isolation exercise helps you connect to that muscle. Then you can adjust your form and your technique and your connection when you do the compound lift. Uh, same would be true for something like chest or lats or shoulders, for example. Isolation before compound to connect when you have one of those tough to develop, hard to connect to muscles. Would you say that mostly only applies to somebody who has aesthetic goals? Like if you have a general pop person who is just trying to lose 50 to a hundred pounds, um, you know, and even if they're squatting and they don't really feel in their glutes too much, are you really worried right there at that point that they're not mm. feeling it? So long as that you've to the naked eye, their form and technique is safe and it's good. Are you really worrying as a coach and trainer like that, you know, Mark, who needs to lose 100 pounds, is squatting and he's like, hey, I don't feel my glutes like you say, yeah. so you're probably right. not going to go. Dude, you're so right. 100%. Yeah, yeah cuz especially when you're a beginner um and you're just building general fitness, boosting your metabolism, generally losing body fat, you want to stick to movements. You're not even really trying to feel individual muscles at that point. You just want to get stronger and better at these compound lifts. This is why it's a rule, but in fitness, what's interesting is that, you know, most rules, there are cases where they can be broken. And in this case, you're right, it's aesthetic. So I've been working out for a while. I want to develop my my lats, but every time I do rows, every time I do pull-ups, I don't feel it in my lats. I just feel it in my arms. My back doesn't really develop really well. So let's do an isolation lat exercise first, like a dumbbell pullover or a straight arm pull down. Then let's go to you know, pull-ups or pull-downs or rows so that you can then adjust your form and technique and connection and feel that muscle that you've pre-exhausted to uh, to a, somewhat of a degree. Yeah, I'm trying to think of like a functional <clears throat> argument for that because that is an interesting point. Uh, like if I'm quad dominant and I'm not really feeling glute activity, uh, am I going to have trouble hip hinging? Am I going to have trouble with, um, you know, any of my posterior chain lifts? Like, I don't know if it did like impede on, I guess the, the quality of my, the performance of the movement, I would say yes. But like, yeah, to that point, like if you're not necessarily feeling it, uh, may, maybe you're not getting the benefit then of when you, you, you know, go into a hypertrophy phase, which does also play into, uh, you know, strength. Well, that's why I wanted to bring that up because I feel like as long as the the quality of the movement, as far as to the naked eye, like you got good form and technique, it doesn't make a lot of sense to the the average person who's again just a, a general pop weight loss goal. And the reason why I bring that up is because, I, I mean, I remember this training people. Uh, this idea of, because what they normally do, you got to envision somebody who's not being coached by you. That's here's like, oh, I don't feel my glutes when yeah. I squat. So then they start doing donkey kickbacks and they actually just completely neglect the squats because that exercise, feel I it. feel it. Yeah. Yeah. And so this is a mistake that a lot of people make. They, they, they stop doing barbell rows, you know, or deadlifts because, you know, nothing fills their back more than a seated row, you know, right. like they really feel it in that. So they're main indicators, right? So then they, then they it. not only start with that, you know, uh, they start with these isolation movements and they, then they complete, and then they completely eliminate the compound. So, which is like, I think that's what kind of what happens a lot of times because, 
you know, there's this idea of like, well, if I feel it more in that when I'm doing that exercise, it's yeah. probably working you're more work. Better. You're so right. Yeah. Like if you did arm circles like this for like five minutes, you'd feel it in your shoulders more for a beginner than like an overhead press, maybe. Right. Like which one's going to develop better shoulders, right? right? More, you know, round shoulders, stronger right. shoulders. Now, in the case of functional exercise, the only way I could see this being applied, and I think it would be applied differently though, would be to help change their technique a little bit. So if you notice their technique in a particular lift and you're trying to get them to move in a particular way, you know certain muscles are involved, mm -hmm. and then maybe you can have them work those muscles. For example, mm -hmm. I may have someone do some rows before a bench press to get them to sit in a retracted shoulder position. Very different application than what I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, the right? only, I mean, one of them I, that comes to mind <clears throat> for me is just like bracing technique and, and in terms of core access. Uh, you know, that's one of the first ones that when I'm training somebody new that we got to, we got to feel that out. We got to be able to get connectivity there mm. in order for you then to be able to cue when you're going into these compound lifts of how to properly brace and support your spine. Yeah, yeah, totally. What's up everybody. Today's oh. giveaway, MAPS Anabolic Advanced, the newest MAPS program. Here's how you can win. Leave a comment below in the first 24 hours that we drop this video. Subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications. If you win, we'll let you know in the comment section that you won free access to MAPS Anabolic Advance. Also, we got a brand new workout program bundle on sale this month right now. MAPS 15 Minutes, MAPS Anywhere, MAPS Prime, and the Eat for Performance ebook all together in a bundle, one low price, $99.99. If you're interested, just click on the link at the top of the description below. All right, here comes the show. Dude, speaking of strength training, I just read the most awesome uh, mainstream news article on gyms. Oh, yeah? Where to, me, get, where to get who released this was it? From, this is on CNN Business. It's a mainstream article. Oh, okay? wow. Okay? And let me tell you, nobody can call fitness trends like we can. Okay? <laughs> I'm telling you this right a, now. You a wrote pat, a whole book on this, this dude. pat ourselves on the back I, <laughs> I swear to God, we were talking about this at least five years ago and saying this is where it's going to go. This is where it needs to go. Here's the title of this article. Americans have changed the way they exercise. Here's how gyms are adapting. These are big box, like everyday people who work out gyms. Mm -hmm. They are investing, and they're talking to uh, Planet Fitness, 24 Hour Fitness, like these major big brand gyms, and they are shifting the equipment that they're buying and the space that they're dedicating from cardio to strength training. Oh, they're, what do you know? They are saying that the, that the surge in popularity, they said strength training has been the most popular exercise class booked during the last two years. These are on class pass. So this is like anything that says strength training mm -hmm. is really popular. And then here's a quote. Strength training has become so much more widely embraced and accepted for all kinds of outcomes. Aesthetic, weight loss, bone health, and balance. So what they're, and it's funny, they're taking away stationary cardio equipment like ellipticals and treadmills, which now they're seeing a huge drop off. So like big gym companies, what they wow. do, and I knew this through working with 24 Fitness, they would go in, they'd have people that would go in and watch usage of the gyms. And they would, of course, survey their, their, their managers. Now, when I was managing gyms in late 90s, early 2000s, so much money was dedicated to cardio, right. huge cardio areas and ellipticals and treadmills and Stairmasters and the latest cardio machine. This is where everybody wanted to go. When people would buy a membership. If you're touring a gym, that's the first place you go. That's the first place. They're saying now that the usage of cardio areas has dropped off significantly and the usage of strength training areas is going through the roof. Wow. And I they're mean, shifting the way they're making this, pretty cool. This is what makes me miss a little bit about being in uh, the gyms, you know, we don't, we didn't get to see this because it would be really interesting to, because yeah, you're watching that culture shift. You're talking about full circle right now because isn't that crazy? I, I remember being far enough back in when the cardio space was relatively small and I watched it expand. I, I mean, at every gym that I worked at, I had the opportunity to work there when there was, you know, X amount of pieces of cardio equipment and I watched it grow. Yep. Like, so I watched it go from, you know, whatever square footage footprint and to expand because of the demand for it of, you know, it was really tough. You'd be touring a, a, a member, a new potential member, and then there would be everybody on the cardio machine and sometimes lines. Lines, yeah. Lines, yep. and that would be like a drawback. People would be like, oh, is it really always this busy? Like, what if I want to get it? And so, and you always would have to find a creative way to navigate through that conversation. 
But and so they were always or you'd be like, oh, we're getting ready to expand. We're adding, you know, three more pieces of elliptical or whatever. So the fact that they're actually getting rid of that is really well, interesting. In that article, the area. So what they're doing, these so they, they, they interview people that work for these large uh, companies who go in and design these gyms. Mm -hmm. And they're saying that they're taking away square footage from cardio areas. They're adding literally this is what it says in the article, more squat racks, more dumbbells more barbells and then one more thing that's really awesome grass N more free space yeah well i've just noticed that's been a slight trend i yes. don't know how popular but i've noticed a lot more gyms designing that in for areas where you could drag pull a sled or yes. just do lunges oh that yes. Ex yes. that exploded that <laughs> yeah. when we were on our way out that started happening almost every gym yeah. and, and now you go to almost any commercial gym they and have that they've Super all cool. so yeah, what's, they've what's, all what's cool about this is that the <clears throat> the gym industry has been driven by trends since day one and they come and go. This one, I think, is going to stick around because more people are going to strength train, and the strength training is going to produce the kind of results that people like. They're going to do it and be like, "Oh my God, this is awesome!" Yeah, and it's we effective. are we are seeing the beginning of the resistance training revolution that we oh predicted. Are you so How? smart to write a book about that? <laughs> <laughs> How freaking rad is that, yeah. though? Right? Uh, no, that's actually really cool. Isn't dude. that awesome? Yeah, no, no, yeah, yeah it got me got me super excited. You know, uh, hearing that, about that's that. Re that's really cool. Yeah. Anyway, I wanted to mention uh, Organifi real quick. I've been so consistent with their green juice, and I tell you what, um, I you know, I, I I it makes a big difference. Yeah, it makes a big difference with digestion. Um, it's funny you bring that and up. And overall, you too. Yeah, so that was it's been a real effort uh, every night to to make sure that I mix it in with some water mm -hmm. and just the uh, consistency of it because my gut has been so off lately. Uh, besides that, and, and I know probiotics and you know there's been other things that I've been trying to include and also um, you know uh, omega threes and, and uh, fish oil, but like that's been one of those that I'm like I gotta it has to be a staple because mm -hmm. I I do eat vegetables, but I know like the volume is not even near what where I, you need I, to be yeah it's not even <laughs> yeah. close yeah. i gotta get back to the packets because i have the the scoop at home and i i find myself making excuses not to use it as much because it's less convenient mm. it's so funny like how little stupid things like that <laughs> it's literally a split second it is it is and, <clears throat> well it's the mess right like if i have to scoop it in the little water like the, the cutting the the little pack individual packets and then pouring it into a thing it just makes it so easy you could travel with it easier that mm -hmm. way having the scoopers and since i've gone through all my individual packets i'm down to the scooper i already see the difference in how much i use it so uh, i don't perfect. know if it, is there a price difference between the two of those do you know Doug? i think it's more expensive to get the packets of course would I, I would assume it's that's a little convenience thing. yeah i would I'd imagine that but i mean for it's worth it to me because i know that i would i use the packets because i if i travel that's when i that's when i used to use it the most but i'm trying to be more consistent with that's it. i mean i'm way more consistent I when i do that if i yeah. use the scooper i'm not i'm, I'm not yeah. as consistent it's something that i need to i mean you just I, we literally all just ate right now and if you looked at everybody meals it's a you know a starchy carb <laughs> and a meat and protein. then protein no protein. no no veg <laughs> you know why because vegetables suck reheated dude nobody wants like uh, yes reheated broccoli no. or asparagus i used like, to be ugh. so good at it too i gotta get back on it man i used to be really good remember i used to come yeah. with you're like, the bowl, bowl of, of broccoli yeah. 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 no dude and I, gotta, into a I, I just had a conversation not... with jessica uh on the way to work and we're both like you know what let's just start cooking big batches of well-cooked vegetables so that we have we have it to eat three, four times a day. That's what you got to do. You got to eat throughout the day. <clears throat> it keeps, it gives you that fiber, keeps things moving, allows you to assimilate your protein better. Cause you know, when your gut health's off, you're just, nothing feels good. You just feel like crap. Yeah. You know, talk, uh, talking about, you know, chatting with wife about stuff. Last night, uh, Katrina and I were talking about something. We were watching the, the Warriors game. And so it, it gave me uh, some dad trivia for you guys. Here's some dad trivia again for you guys. See if I keep mm. this, this trend going right now. What does the, Universal sixty-year-old man uh, celebration look like at a sporting event. Wait, wait, See, wait, wait. So envision, yes. envision a sixty-year-old <laughs> oh, man oh, oh, at a sporting event. What does it look like? What is it? What is it? Oh, and he's Cele celebrating. Yeah, a celebration of like Hold you on. scored a touchdown or we just hit a big three. Like it, when I do it, I feel like you guys are gonna see it right away because I was do. I saw it and Katrina and I started cracking up. I was like, if I. If you catch me ever do that, you have the right to slap me in the slap me in the chest and I be can't like, think of it. Go ahead, let me see. <laughs> it's, it's like that's true. Can you, can you see it? Mechanical yeah, robot. See, yeah, it's, you know what I'm saying? You're like, yeah. you know, you know what it is? Pulling you, levers. You know what? This could this could throw a shoulder, <laughs> an elbow out. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? You, you know can't what? twist. Any, no rotation. No. You know what I'm saying? It's 
<laughs> Keep it tight. Yeah. Keep yeah. it tight. This is my range of motion. Right? <laughs> they, they zoomed in on this like old guy. I, you know, there was a big, a big like comeback run. The the Warriors went on, and, and it was like a big three. And you know, they were cutting a commercial, and it cut to the old guy. You know, and he's celebrating like that. It's like I, I said, the day that I do that, I said, you have the right to just slap me right on the side. Like, I used to have this older cousin. Oh, he was a lot. Funny. He was a lot older, so he was kind of like an uncle. And whenever, this is back in the 80s, so I was a kid, and this is when 49ers were all just crushing right in the Bay Area, winning all the Super Bowls. And every time they would hit a touchdown or something, he'd hit the shit out of us. That's how we'd say, yeah, yeah, we'd run away and shit. I was like, what are you doing? Yeah. When we were in high school, it was a thing to uh, dogpile when the touchdown mm -hmm. happened. So there was a group of us that would go to all the games. Bro, that's almost as bad as my pillow. And fight. after, no, the, yeah. no <laughs> that, was, that was brutal. You come out, bloody nose. You're like, yeah. <laughs> I bet you, were. you were on the bleachers. <laughs> And then it was literally oh, a you're talking about the game in high school. Yeah, oh. on the bleachers in the game, like you would be at the game, and all of a sudden you would create this massive like dog pile, like everybody like piling. And that was like you wanted to be the first, like you do not want to be the one that the first person jumped on because then everybody just Dude, piled on. It's funny you say that though, because like I told you guys about my roommate in college, and he's like six eight, and like you know Huge. he was like three sixty where. And so he would get, a, I would try so hard not to make him laugh half the time because when he laughs, like he'd get real animated and he would do that. He'd like hit me, yeah. you know, <laughs> oh, like this big ogre. One time, like I got him laughing so hard. He was in my Jeep and he's like laughing, oh, broke the seat and like <laughs> all the way down. And he's like laying down there. <laughs> he like broke my car and he never fixed and it. And he busted the, uh, um, so the dashboard, like he's like laughing. So he punches the dashboard and it exploded. And he never fixed it. At no, never fixed oh. it. I, Dude, just, I like, duct taped it. I think I saw something on the news the other day. You, okay. Um, you guys know how like so many stores now are moving to the self checkout. Yeah. You ever wonder like how many people like steal? Yes. Do I wonder? Does it ever cross your mind? Yes. Okay, so do you see what what's happening with Walmart right now? What are they doing? Okay, so they have the ability to to keep track of like how often you do this and then there's a threshold when people get over it, and there's like all these massive arrests all over the United States happening. Wait, right now. so they'll let you get away with it for a little yes. bit? Yes. Wow. Look it up, Doug. Pull this up. I just saw it on the news. I was like So they're all the under the impression like, that, oh, it's like, easy. Well, no. Bro, they, they told us like well, the main story that I saw was like a sixty eight year old woman who they came after. Because she had so many of these that she was doing. It's like, so oh. So they have cameras and stuff, I guess. Yeah, Obviously, recording your face. Yes. Right? Yeah, the whole time. And, and like, you know, you make you make one mistake and you don't scan Gotta something. Got to move to San Francisco. Yeah, see, yeah. are you pulling it up right now? <laughs> don't let you get away with it. <laughs> yeah. get away with it's murder. Walmart who I think is the, the main one that's going after people like this. Walmart arrests over self-checkout well, line I'm gonna theft. I'm going to confess right now. I did something pretty bad with the self-checkouts. Oh, what'd you do? When they were doing the, uh, you can only have two cartons of eggs. Uh, you know, limitation. Yeah. I would go through the self-checkout. Oh, four, four, four to six cartons of eggs. Yeah. Dang. You pull it up, Doug? Yeah. So it seems like they're uh, targeting Rebel. this type of theft. For wow. Sure. Yeah. 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 Good. Good. Yeah. That and catalytic converters. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you've ever had anyone who had that stolen? Bro, how does that My buddy. How do they do that? Okay. They go, they just go under your cars and they saw it off. Well, I don't understand. What do you do with it? It's platinum mean? in it. They just, yeah. They resell them, right? There's or, platinum in it? Yeah. Yes. That, that or oh, copper. Is that it? Is it copper? Oh. No, copper's cheap. Like platinum. I think it's platinum. I'll, well, I know I'll copper pipes they'll steal. They'll, yeah. Like a, like a construction Job sites. Site. Yeah. That's, yes. That's we huge. were actually so over, they do? They over, it, over in the Central Valley. This happened to me about- mm, uh, Palladium seven. and platinum. So <sighs> about seven, eight years ago, I'm over with my buddies in the Central Valley. We're over by his place. And we go golfing one afternoon and, you know, it was like midweek, middle of the day, out in the middle of nowhere, this golf course. And we come out and we get in and he fires his car. It sounded like a freaking race car. <laughs> <laughs> it, was like, it was like an old like Toyota truck. And we're like, whoa, bro, what the, what's that? What's you wrong with flow masters on this yeah, thing? Yeah, it, it didn't even dawn on us what had happened. It took a minute before, and his car was driving fine. It just didn't have, it was just literally cut, they cut the exhaust from the Cadillac converter back. Wow. Yeah, and, and stole it. I'm like, what so in the middle the of the day at a golf course parking lot, we got uh, our, our Cadillac converter jacked. How? Dang. Now, would you be tempted, be honest, you see someone under your car doing oh, that, would you be tempted I, to turn the car uh, and drive? <laughs> While they're underneath No, them? I would they're drag them out it? by their leg and kick the shit out of oh. them. I think stealing from somebody like that, bro, is, it's up there with like one of the, like the yeah. worst things. So invasive, dude. I think. So personal. Yeah, yeah they it need is. To, the, the crimes that need to be, pun we pun we unfortunately we punish, uh, you know, crimes that are nonviolent or what should I say? They, we, we, we punish crimes without a victim more than ones with the victim. Yeah. Property crimes and violent 
crimes against people need to be punished the highest. Yeah. Possession of drugs and stuff you do to yourself, that shouldn't be punished nearly as high. Well, and two, like I, if they have like tools with them and, and like it's all premeditated, like that makes it so much worse. It is. You know, because it's not like they're just like randomly just snatching and, and you know, like, so I'll whatever. I'll but. tell you guys a funny story, bro. You guys want to, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see if I could say this without nobody knowing what I'm talking about. So I have a family member who had their tools stolen out of the back of their truck. Okay. Okay. So they had all all these awesome, like really expensive tools stolen out of the back of their truck. Now he suspected that it was another, it was a person that he, that they worked with. Okay. And at this job site, it's all these other Sicilians. So it's a family member of mine that's Sicilians, all these other Sicilians. Now he knows that Sicilians are superstitious. So he goes to work that next day, tells everybody about his tools getting stolen and then says, but it's okay because I hired a witch doctor to put a curse on whoever stole my tools <laughs> yeah. and it's going to curse the, them. It's going to curse their children and their whole families. And the next day his tools were back in the back. Of his <laughs> no truck. way. I swear to God. No bro. way. I swear to God, bro. Is that a true story? That is true story. Really? Yes. And people listening and watching right now. Know. I feel like you would know who did that then. Like who's the most, who's the, you know, no people listen, people listening right now who have, relatives from Sicily, old relatives, they will tell you they are so superstitious. <laughs> Don't bro. put that voodoo on me. Yes. Oh they God. put the tools back That's in the a, truck. Not worried about bro. the cops. I'm worried about yes. the, the curse. Yeah. yeah. That's the ma- maloikio they call it, the evil eye. Oh my yeah, God. Yeah, dude. So that's that is funny. Dude. Hey, so I'm 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 taking this um doing the, I want to talk about this uh, workshop or this course that I'm taking right now for parenting. And um, I'm learning some really interesting things about uh, little kids and toddlers. So, you know, obviously I have a two-year-old and he's in that toddler stage where they throw tantrums and do the whole thing. So I went to the, the course, they have all these modules on there. And I went to this course on tantrums and I'm learning about like little kids and why they have these tantrums and stuff like that. And uh, it's really fascinating. It actually teaches me a lot about just even adults. So little like toddlers they start to develop feelings, but they don't have coping mechanisms. So the feelings are bigger than their ability to cope. So they're dysregulated. And the way they learn how to become regulated is they have to become co-regulated. So the job of the parent, this is what I'm reading, right? The job of the parent is to provide stability, boundaries, and calmness. So you are helping them co-regulate by lending them these regulation skills. And you have to do this over and over again before the kid learns how to develop these coping mechanisms to these big feelings that they have. Really fascinating. So you going through that, okay, what would you, because I obviously I try, I mean, it's I try and guess or speculate that, oh, it was probably this that we do really well, or oh, it's probably these things that we do really well. But, um, and the, or is it just genetic? Our son is this way. But I have been really blessed. I have he's going to be four years old yeah. in a couple months, and I never had terrible twos. I never had tantrums. I never had anything like that. It's not like my son's never cried or wanted. That's someone. the exception, though, right? Most kids will go through a period where well, they I have mean, some, right? So I, I think there was a time when they looked like they were going to happen, but Katrina and I were we never we never allowed it ever to kind of change our our level of energy around him. Yeah, that's excellent. So like, it's like if he, so if, he can have it, he feels safe having his, yeah, his I mean, if he, if he gets in it, like I'll look at her and just be like, Oh, let him, let him figure his thing out. And like, we just let him do his thing. Mm-hmm. Like let him be frustrated for a little bit. Don't pay attention to it. Not trying. No, oh, don't say, don't do that. Like, it's just, you know, yeah. Cause they I don't, say, I, so I'm, I'm asking you from what you're learning. If I told you that, I've had this great experience with my son. Now Katrina and I have all of the things that we speculate what we attribute it more to. What would you guess based off of knowing, you know me, you know that's Katrina. That's probably, I mean, that's got to be a part of it because as I'm reading it, I mean, what you don't want to do, they also say don't ignore your kid because like, like leave him alone because it teaches them then to bury or like it's shameful. So you want to be there, mm-hmm. but you don't want to, your job as the parent is not to have the feelings, the big feelings. Yeah. Your job is to show them kind of how to cope and how to regulate. Um, they also talk in that module about um, like y- you can do what's called emotional, like she called it emo- emotional vaccination. So you can prepare your kid for like a tough uh, thing that's going to happen. And you can say, hey, tomorrow John's coming over to play with you. Oh, that's going to be so fun. Ooh, you know, he's probably going to want to play with your favorite cars. That's probably going to feel really frustrating, you know, and you kind of walk through 
what that's going to feel like and what that looks like. Mm. Then there was some other stuff where they showed, uh, this one I thought was really brilliant. You can use like toys and you can act out things like, uh, you know, oh, uh, baby bear, you know, mama bear is going to go to work. Baby bear doesn't like that. So baby bear is going to cry. But, you know, mama bear always comes back and you play it out and that allows them to play out their feelings before it all comes. How much together. does that make you realize what a genius Mr. Rogers That's was? That's what I was genius. Just, just going because genius. You, you know what's weird about that is um, that was big as we were growing up. Yeah, like even in uh, I mean, I, and I had different experiences going through church, but there was always like um, different programs that would incorporate puppets, and then they would kind of act out a lot of mm -hmm. those situations, and it would bring to light a lot of like. Uh, um, I feel like kids kids would respond to that really well and like really engage with it, and it would teach them those type of uh, ways to deal with hard situations. Well, you know what I didn't realize until I watched the documentary because I watched Mister Rogers as a kid. But mm -hmm. to be honest with you, I don't remember a lot. Of, like there's things like when I watch back the clips, I'm like, oh, I remember that yeah. episode or like little things. But I couldn't tell you the the <clears> true <throat> lessons that I probably learned from him. What I didn't realize until I watched the documentary was how much current event. Uh, tragedy and drama. He he was preparing he the kids for what. It. Yeah. yeah, and so the just yeah. the brilliance of that, knowing like, mm -hmm. oh, we have this war going on right now that our our country is in. So the kids probably going to see this stuff on TV, and here's parents. Right. So here he was acting out with these puppets and totally appropriate for that age. Yes, not yeah. like, hey, watch the news. Here's what's scary. Here's yes, what's yes. And so I mean, I, we do that a lot to kids now as we show them. Yeah. Really scary shit. We inundate them and then, too but much. We don't, but they yeah. don't have the ability to cope or to yeah. deal with, and they don't even have the ability to do anything about it. Hey, the climate's gonna, uh, it's gonna be ten years. We're all gonna be dead because exactly. the oceans are gonna yeah, whatever. It's all alarmist. And, yeah, and they'll, they'll tell your parents not to, you know, to recycle and that. And these kids are like freaked out. Um, it's not appropriate. We, we and they don't, don't have happen. the ability. We know what happens. They're they're all about 17, 16 years old now. <laughs> a bunch of activists, dude. Everybody. Yeah. That's like the, that's like the thing now, dude. I feel like that's what. A lot of the education is around is is bringing so much attention and awareness to this that it it pressures that generation that the generation that we just had come up and yet we have the most anxious depressed uh, yeah, you know, know kids I know. easily manipulated but I, I did not realize how brilliant Mr Rogers was so until brilliant I, yeah I, and I'm and watching this and listening to it um you know to me it's like and then I realize why so I have this ability good and bad where I can turn off like a, like a tough feelings or emotions. Literally, you guys have seen me do it. You know, something's going on real tough. Mm -hmm. Going to get on the show, boom, I'm a completely different person. That's good in some cases. It's a survival mechanism. It's also bad because I'm not in touch with a lot of the ways that I feel. And that means I can't be in touch with the way my kid feels or what's going on with them because I don't know it in myself. So as I'm watching this this thing, I'm like, oh man, that's, you know what's, that's how it happened. You know what's hard, <laughs> you know what's hard about that stuff and that what I, I think about with my son is like... Um, you know, what is what is the right balance of, you know, pursuing this like being a perfect parent and then also making sure that I incorporate adversity because even emotional adversity. Right. There's got to be there's some positives to that, too. So you say some of those yeah. things like right? you, you you challenge your kid and oh this he's going to emotionally react. This is bad. Or you leave him alone. You isolate him. And then he's uh, but then. That there, there's some negative, obviously, outcomes of that, but then there also that might have made him this super independent person as an adult later on. So it's like, I think about that a lot. Like, okay, I, I'm doing. I feel like I'm doing a really good job of trying to be this very well balanced, you know, father. With yeah, that's son. a really good it's like question. Calculated introduction. That's a really, it's a really, really tough. question. Yeah, but because... the, but then I think of all the things that I think about when I think about myself and the, the yeah, but you know, I want to say this though too, Adam, you are an anomaly. Okay. Because 99% of people who grew up the way you did do not end up the way you do. So it did form you and forge you into this, this, you know, remarkable individual. But most, I don't say 99, but majority of people who grew up in that type of a situation. It's over half. I mean, that's a fact. Yeah. It's over. It's. A, I mean, there's plenty of statistics around that. So, that but it's you, over but half. maybe there's this magic mix. Of, well, exactly. Yeah. So, so obviously I understand that yeah. taking him through my path is, is statistically <laughs> not a good idea. You know what I'm saying? I'm gambling yeah. with the fact that he could turn out good for <laughs> Every me. Every once in a while I just randomly hit him. Yeah. yeah take so, a shit. <laughs> but, the, but then there, you know, there's got to be some sort of a, a, a balance yeah, there, right, of you know, uh, allowing him to to not have it like perfect when it comes to, you know, regulating emotions and, and adversity. Like, how do I... You guys brought it up the other day. I think sports is a great way. Yeah, I, I, You really I, blew my mind with that the other day. I was thinking about that because sports is a controlled... 
-hmm. you're going to get your ass kicked. You're going to lose a lot. You're going to suck at things environment. That it's, is somewhat safe. Right? It's one it's, of the. It's almost like a pageant, right? Like we're we're like acting out uh, what's going to happen in life. Yes, you know, but in, in extremes, like situations where you have to react or you have to, um, you know, face those challenges immediately, and it's and it's not as much thought that goes into it. It's more of like, okay, what happened, and like, how can I yep. overcome that? I I totally time? agree. I think the part that that scares me is that I might have the kid who doesn't care about sports. You know, well, he can the, compete in a lot of well, different ways, though. Right? I hope it know? doesn't matter. That, like, honestly, I have, so I have one of those too. Like my oldest, he's not not real. Doesn't care, like he doesn't have a competitive bone in his body right now. But that all again, and this is something that Courtney always calms me down with is like that can change, and it has, yeah. you know. And he shows like as he grows up, like he, his interests change and shifts. But um, I think too, it's it's still really an important thing. Just as school, do you want them in school? Do you want them to be educated, you know, uh, cognitively? Do you also want them to be educated physically? And so this mm -hmm. is, I think it's it, it, whatever that looks like in some physical form of challenge, like needs to be placed in front. And I love the school that we're in right now. I'm like, so it's, so now it's, Max has been in three schools. Yeah. You keep saying this. You really like this place. Yeah. yeah. I mean, dude, the kid is learning presidents right now. Mm. He's fucking three. And he's having wow. fun. Yeah. Oh yeah. He loves going to school. Yeah, that's, that, that's actually if first. If they love how to learn, that's at, it. Man. Yeah. At that age, like first and foremost, he's got to like to go. Like, I don't want to take the kid somewhere where he hates, hates. And he loved the last school and mm. the last school. I had no, I have no qualms or anything bad to say about the last school, but boy, we've only been going to this school now for what a month or so, mm -hmm. maybe a little bit lo longer than that. And he comes home with like the stuff that he's working on. And so I see like the, the way they're teaching him how to sound out certain words mm -hmm. and to count and to add already. And like just that. And you can see him already processing it and uh, picking it up where I didn't see that in the, the the previous two schools. So there, so there's obvious a lot more focus around the academics in the school that he's in now, which I, I really love and appreciate. You know, you know, it's that. probably true about uh, parenting is that like, 85 to 90 percent of it is just caring to be a better parent no i you, you know what i'm yeah. saying you say it wasn't it arthur brooks who says that mm -hmm. arthur brooks said something to you one time that you've repeated on the show that i've then repeated to a lot of people that i thought was one is a really powerful statement is that he, he, someone asked him when he got in a cab i believe like and it was about like fa being a good father yeah. Yeah, like, and he up. said you've already you, you, no, he said you've already you're already 50 percent there he said because you care yeah he yeah, said yeah. because you care the fact that you care you're already ahead yeah. of half of the other fathers because that's a big part is that the, they, yeah. they don't even care enough to be thinking about it enough. And so you're already on the right track. Right. And I'm like, that's such a good point is that, you know, you're, it's impossible to be a perfect dad. I know that I'm, I'm not going to make, make every decision right. I know that I could I'll look back one day and say, I should have done this instead of that. But the fact that you're as a father at this point in their young life already actively thinking about that a lot. I think that puts you at a major advantage in comparison. Yeah. No, right? definitely. Adam, I want to ask you, um, uh, we're, we're supposed to talk about Ned. You Do you still use Mellow on a, every night? Religiously. One or two packets? Are you One. two packets? So I know Dr. Cabral told me to do two, being completely honest on the show. I I am not consistent with that because I've trained myself already. to. It's a night routine. It's it's now. Do you do right before bed or like an hour before? No, right before. Well, okay. about about a half hour before. So that's actually a really good, a good point because what I've noticed, and, and again, I don't know if this is just like a correlation thing or if it actually is a, a true causation of this or not. But when I take the Ned, it actually like within about a half hour to hour, it makes me feel sleepy. That makes sense. So that's how long it takes the magnesium to see. And then, it, but if I if I take it like four hours before. I'll get that kind of feeling. And then obviously if it's only like six o'clock at night, I'm not going to bed and then it passes. And then I don't feel the same benefits, which is weird because I know it's like the reason why I'm feeling these benefits is because I'm probably magnesium deficient. I give the body the right magnesium and then it, but then yet if I take it too early, I don't seem to get the same. Oh, that like, must be the GABA. There's mm -hmm. GABA in there as well. Okay. So, yeah. So GABA uh, affects the neurotransmitters of the brain and it. It's a relaxing compound and that's probably the reason why you notice that kick in and then go away because it's in and out yeah i have found the sweet okay. spot of when it's like right after dinner um but when katrina and i basically decided we're going to head upstairs to our bedroom um that is when i will will take it because i know that i have this nice little half hour hour window when i want to go to sleep and if i take it too soon it tends to pass and i don't get the same effects from all right, it all right, cool. all right let's do a, a quick shout out uh we just had jay campbell on the podcast and the dude is fire I oh, love, I love he's when, a wealth of information. He's a good, he's a, he's a fun guy. I, yeah. yeah. I love when we 
meet somebody who I know like very little about and I have, so I have no idea what, what to expect. And most times to be honest with you, we do so much of this and I'm like, I'm not that excited. I'm like, because I think I'm let down more often than not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I love when we meet somebody who like, like instantly hit it off. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like we're, we're exchanging phone numbers before the day's even over and already texting each other and stuff like that. Like what a very cool dude. And just a wealth of knowledge fire around. hose oh knowledge. my god yeah. around yeah. i just want to hang out with him all day and keep asking questions keep so. asking questions yeah. all so day. Is, was he J, J campbell 333 uh, is that on instagram doug that's correct there yeah. you go hey check this out uh do you want to know if your hormones are optimized is your testosterone potentially low this is true for both men and women are you interested in using peptides to augment your fitness boost muscle growth burn body fat improve cognitive performance well, check this out. We work with Transcend, and these are people that help work with peptides and hormone therapy. See if it's right for you. Go to mphormones.com, talk to one of their professionals, and see if peptide therapy and hormone therapy is right for you. Again, it's mphormones.com. All right, here comes the rest of the show. Our first caller is Brooke from Pennsylvania. Hey, Brooke, how you doing? How can we help you? I'm good. How are you guys doing? Good. Very good. Great. All right. So I just want to thank you guys so much for having me on the show to ask you guys a question. Um, I'll get right into it with a little bit of background of where I'm at. Um, I never really exercised regularly until about 2019. I got into weight training a little bit, but I never really had a proper program until March of 2022, at which point I just kind of got focused on building strength and focusing on building up some muscle. And I did that until January of 2023. And now I am in the final week of phase two of MAPS Anabolic. Um, the main topic of my question today actually has to do with nutrition and uh, having a healthy relationship with food. So I do have a history of disordered eating. Um, when I was a young teenager around like 14, 15, I did deal with some anorexia and a short period of some bulimic behaviors. Um, and then once I was about 16, I never really recovered from that or moved on from it. I just kind of moved into a different form of disordered eating. So I've been kind of binge eating on and off since I was about 16. But in the past eight to 12 months, I have developed something very weird. And basically, I can stick to a meal plan all day and do perfect. But I go to sleep at night and I will wake up at some point during the night with just an uncontrollable urge to eat. And it feels like I cannot go back to sleep until I eat something. Typically that is something sugary or some sort of carbs. So I just really want to get some advice on how to build a healthy relationship with food since I've never really had one. So my question here is, have any of you ever worked with a client that has had this type of disordered eating? And do you have any advice for myself or anyone like me who is dealing with this and just wants to build a healthy relationship with food? Yeah, Brooke, I had a client with a uh, night eating syndrome before. I have too. Mm -hmm. So, okay. So have you worked with, uh, with a therapist on any of this? I have in the past, I have current, I had to switch and I have not been able to find any therapists in my area that are both accepted by my insurance and really like willing to say, okay, I think I can work with you on this. Okay. Cause that's, so that's, that's been a struggle. That's where I'm going to, I'm going to point you. Cause I, I could give you structures. I could say to you, um, set up your meal plan so that it allows you to have food in the middle of the night. So it works within your meal plan. I could say something like, you know, I, I've heard people say that they put a lock on yeah. their cabinet, you know, and, and that they, in order for them to get it, they have to like do this process, which, you know, gives them pause type of deal. But the problem, and, and I want to say this too, before I go on, none of us are, are therapists or experts in eating disorders. We've just trained a lot of clients and so probably have dealt with a few of these. So if from my experience working with clients and working with my client's therapist, this is where I learned the most, okay, is I would get a client with some form of disordered eating. And then what I would do is I would ask them if it was okay if I worked with their therapist. And then I would work with the therapist to work with the client. And what I learned from that was that if there's something that's unresolved, that this is going to manifest itself uh, in, in 101 different ways. So you'll stop it from manifesting 
by I'm not going to binge during the day anymore. But then what it does is it manifests into night eating disorder or I'm going to stop, you know, anorexia, but then it turns into bulimia or I'm going to stop, uh, you know, um, I'm going to create so much structure, but then it manifests as orthorexia. So there's something that's unresolved and there's something at the root. And if we don't, this is like taking painkillers to stop a headache that's being caused by you hitting your head against the wall. Like we have to stop that. The painkillers may mask the pain, but if we don't solve the root issue, then what's going to happen is even if you figure out a way to prevent yourself from having disordered eating, it may manifest itself in some other disordered something. Sometimes it turns into, um, it's not a may drug. It will. Yeah. It, it will. It, it could be drug abuse. Okay. It could be exercise addiction. It could be, you know, promiscuity. It could be like, a, a, like so many different ways. So you have to address the root issue and all of your attempts at, putting boundaries and walls around this, you'll find yourself becoming more and more frustrated. And what may happen by, by pushing this further and further is it, the, the manifestations may get worse and louder. Okay. So, uh, okay. so my advice is this, uh, put your efforts into finding someone you can work with on figuring out the root cause. Cause until you do that, I mean, you can figure out how to figure out not to eat in the middle of the night, but it's going to come out in some other different way. It's probably what's going to happen. There's there's really not too much to add to that because Sal's right. Like at the end of the day, even if we gave you this incredible hack that helped you out temporarily, it will manifest itself somewhere else, um, some other way. And so absolutely uh, getting getting counseling through this is the, the number one focus. There are things I think that you can potentially do during that process because- Obviously, it's not like you go to one, you know, therapy session and all of a sudden you're cured or something, right? So there is stuff that you strategies you can do. First of all, I would not keep these foods in my house. Like for me, I like the ice cream weakness and stuff like that. Like not having them in my house is the first step to to not allow myself to to do things like that. Right, right. The other one would be structure my diet to where I'm eating like a, you know, higher fat, higher calorie meal, like right before bed, because I ate less calories through the day. And so right. I, I, I'm, I'm kind of helping that, like hoping that I don't wake up with some sort of craving by doing that. So that, that could help too. Um, okay. so you could structure it that way. You eat the same amount of calories you put in, or another thing too, is like, I don't know exactly what your deficit is right now. Maybe you're at too large of a deficit. And so it's like, you're cutting weights, maybe cut less calories or eat closer to maintenance instead of restricting so many calories. So you're not so hungry. And then also have, you know, structure it in a way to where, uh, you know, the bulk of the calories is towards the end of the day. So you don't feel like you're also really hungry right. at night. So those are some like temporary strategies that I think you can do to potentially help mitigate this while you're working on the root cause. But Sal's right at the end of the day that uh, even if we solve this one issue for you, it will, it will manifest itself somewhere else. Yeah. In, I, in I do want to add this too, Brooke. Um, I'm very hopeful for you for a couple different reasons. One, oh, yeah. uh, the, you're on a podcast live telling us, and you're very open and you're 22 and you're doing this. That is huge. Very self-aware. That is huge because uh, it, it, it will. It's almost impossible to work or solve if the person can't. Most people don't even admit it to themselves, let alone right. tell other people, and let alone put it out there for other people uh, to listen to. So you are you've actually you're actually beyond the hardest step. So okay. everything from here is going to be positive. You just have to take those uh, those next steps. Here's one thing I'll say, and you could try this. What I said earlier still stands. Okay. Yeah. But here's what I'm going to say that you could try and it's going to be painful and it's going to suck and it's probably going to result in some sleepless nights uh, initially. Okay. Could you replace eating with something else in the middle of the night? In other words, you know, a blanket um, piece of advice would be when you get up in the middle of the night and you have that crazy craving mm -hmm. and you can't go back to sleep unless you satisfy it. Maybe you sit down and you, and you journal and you journal and journal and journal. And if you don't go back to sleep, so be it. But you journal okay. the entire time. That's going to be painful. You're going to have to deal with whatever feelings come up and you're going to have to deal yeah. with the sleeplessness that is probably going to come from that initially. Okay. Um, and that's just, that's just one example. It could be journaling. It could be meditation. It could be prayer. Um, it could be something mindful. 
nothing distracting. So I, I wouldn't want you to replace this with something that's distracting, like watching TV, like watching TV, listening to music, uh, like trying to just like, okay, I got to distract myself type yeah, of deal. Doing cardio or something. You got to right, get right, in. That makes sense. Yeah. You got to get into what the hell you're feeling, which sucks. It sucks. I'm going to be straight up with you. Oh too. yeah. So I like journaling a lot because what journaling does is it's a form of thinking that allows you to take pause and end uh, what are known as, uh, as cycles of thinking. So when we keep thoughts in our head, we tend to cycle thoughts, but when mm -hmm. we write them down, we tend to complete thoughts. And you'll notice, okay. when, you'll notice when you write what you're feeling and thinking, it's more complete and it's, and it's, it's, it, you tend to end that cycle of a thought. So it causes less anxiety. It's just more intensive and it forces you to look at what's going on, which is really, really, really hard. So, Maybe try that for now. But in the meantime, okay. I would say look for someone that you could work with that is a therapist that can help you. And they don't necessarily, um, I, I mean, ideally it would be somebody that is an expert on disordered eating, but right. uh, you could also just find a trauma uh, therapist. So, so, so if you're having trouble finding someone with, with who works with eating disorders, that's within your insurance network, uh, broaden your search and look for people who work with trauma. Because okay. the, the skills, there's a lot of carry over there with the skills. Okay, with, absolutely. Yeah. So. Um, in doing this, should I attempt to stay in a deficit or do you think from experience, would it be more beneficial for me to move back towards a maintenance and yes. try to just stay at maintenance until I get this kind of under Here, control? Here's what's going to happen, Brooke. Yes. The mm -hmm. harder you focus and look at your diet, the worse this is going to get. Yeah. Right. Okay. So I want you to do less, not more. So- uh, calorie deficit, maintenance, surplus. Why don't we do this instead? Let's make it easier. Don't worry about maintenance. Don't worry about deficit. Don't worry about surplus. Just give yourself this right here. I'm going to eat as much as I want. I'm just going to eat whole natural foods. That's all. That's the only rule you give yourself. If I want to eat, I'm going to eat. As long as it's whole natural foods, I'll eat a bowl of fruit. I'll eat bananas. I'll eat some steak. I'll eat some chicken. I'll eat a bowl of rice. Uh, but I like if, the sound of that. <laughs> so just do that because what's going to happen is if you place your focus on your calories and macros and you start mm -hmm. counting those things, even if it's maintenance, too much focus is going to make this worse. Less focus okay. tends to make this uh, a little bit better. Okay. Awesome. I, I really appreciate that. You guys, it, the journaling idea, I did begin journaling at the beginning of this year, but I never thought to do it in the middle of the night. When I wake up, I'm definitely going to give that a go, maybe give some meditation or prayer a go. Um, I really hope I see some, some improvements in that. And I'm really hoping I find a therapist that I can, work with soon yes. and expect Brooke expect it to suck. So don't, oh, yeah. don't say, don't think your expectations should not be all right tonight. When I wake up, I'm going to journal and I'm going to feel so much better. Your expectations right. should be, I'm going to journal. It's going to suck way worse. It's going to be really, yep. it's going to suck. It's going to be a whole shitty night of me journaling and whatever. So, yep. so just do that. And then eventually it will get better, but expect it to suck. I can't. Okay. I can do that. Absolutely. Okay. Good. Brooke, I'm gonna, That's uh, not all I got for you guys. I, I really appreciate this. That really did give me some good insight into how I can take okay. some new approaches to this. Yeah. Listen, don't hang up yet. Yeah. Yeah. I think I know okay. where Adam's going. Yeah. Brooke, I, I'm going to have Doug put you in our private forum. Yeah. So, um, yeah why don't you keep, okay. let us, let us, let us follow along. Yeah. Give us some okay. follow up and, and it, it might help to have that kind of support. Absolutely. I really, really appreciate that. You guys. You awesome, got it, bro. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Thank Brooke. you. All right. Thank you so much. No problem. <clears throat> Dare I say, do you see in the future that, like, I just feel like this would be such a great candidate for uh, therapy and psilocybin? Oh. Uh, you talk about somebody who's got, like, yeah. like deep, like. To what, just face it and address yeah, it. Trauma yeah. or issues that are, that are. You know what they're using right now for that? Like, the, here in California. I don't know where she's at if this is legal. But you can actually do ketamine therapy mm -hmm. with therapists and doctors. So it's not, it's like literally uh, with licensed professionals. Yeah. And In a clinical um, setting. Yeah. yeah. And the results that they're getting are phenomenal. Phenomenal. Yes. Phenomenal. So. I, I, I mean, I really think, didn't, didn't another state just de decriminalize it again? I thought I just saw somebody do a post. It's starting to, it starting is. to make its way around right now as far as like, I think in the next five to 10 years, yeah. it's going to become like a. You know, the way like it was very taboo to even talk about marijuana just 10 years ago. Yeah. I think it'll be that widely accepted in the next five to 10 years. Yeah, the ketamine therapy. therapy is really cool. I'm so glad they do that in California. And also, I, again, I want to add, you know, just just keep adding to this. It's like, you know, I dealt with body image issues for a long time. And I mean, I still have them. They're still there. Um, but the hardest part 
was me just admitting to myself, mm-hmm. let alone telling other people. So at her age and what she's saying and to oh, like, yeah. that's such a big, that's such a big, she made deal. a big step just yep. yeah, yeah, admitting that and uh, being honest about it with herself. And I, I, I think it's just so valuable too as a trainer and a coach to, to align yourself with, with a therapist, yes. because there's going to be so many examples like this where just, you know, having somebody to really counsel and talk them through a lot of these things will, you know, spawn such a, a, a great result. Yes. And because this is the big one, what you do as a trainer and a coach for a, someone else uh, would be the wrong opposite thing that you would do for someone like this. Yeah. Like for someone else, yeah, you'd be like, well, track, math write things down, yeah. do the, like you would make someone like this worse. So I, I mean, just want to put an exclamation point on that. If you're a trainer or coach, align yourself with therapists and you get someone like this, do not advise them. You work with the therapist and the therapist is going to advise you on how to handle this. And then you'll do a great job. Our next caller is Lean from Kentucky. Hey, Lean, how can we help you? Hey, guys, I'm so pumped to be on here. Uh, I love you all. As everyone says, I found you when I first started lifting weights and I was around, I think, 17 or 18. So it was the perfect time. I'm 23 now. So I've definitely been a sponge to all of the information that you've put yes. out there. Oh, wow. Awesome. Right. So I reached out because um, I'm struggling with the getting lean part. Lean wants to get lean and she's having a hard time. <laughs> um, <laughs> So I am, I tried a caloric deficit a couple weeks ago. No, it was about a month ago. I was at around 1700 calories. So let me give you like what's going on now. I'm five, six, I'm 150. My scale says I'm around 28% body fat. I don't know if that's accurate. Um, and my deadlift right now is at 215. I think I can squat 185 and I've been running maps anabolic uh, pretty repeatedly. During the summer, I take breaks and I do like boxing and just kind of try to stay active outside the gym just because I travel. Um, I tried aesthetics and it was just too much volume. I started eating everything in front of me. I, I just don't, I don't know. It was, it was a lot. I was eating a lot. My appetite like spiked and then it was just, I was just really tired. So with the caloric deficit, I, I was doing good. I was losing about a pound a week over four weeks. And then all of a sudden I just kind of crashed. My sleep went to garbage. Um, my stress, I seemed pretty sensitive to just general like work lifestyle. Um, and my appetite also crashed, which was weird. I was eating around 120 grams of protein pretty consistently, but, um, I just kind of stopped eating it around around a thousand calories. So I do have like, so I do want to get lean, but also I love being strong and I also play sports and just want to keep up with my endurance. Um, I don't have any crazy timelines or anything like that. So just kind of want to know what I'm doing wrong and how I can make a lasting long-term effect. Okay. I need more context. What else happened during that four week caloric cut? I, I, I see in your notes that you're in law school, uh, mm-hmm. getting ready to graduate. Uh, I have a cousin who's a lawyer. I remember when he was going to law school and did all that, it was like insane amount yeah. of work and studying a lot of stuff. What else happened during that period of time or did anything else happen or did nothing else change? You just did a deficit. I mean, I would say I was like, <laughs> I hear you say with stress that matters. I've, I've asked you about stress before. So I think I was going through something stressful as well to yeah. add to that, but nothing like nothing insanely. Yeah. I would, I mean, even going to the gym, I felt like I lost my strength as well. Like I would try to load the bar with the 25 pounds. I was just getting tired. Yeah. So how was your sleep? So stre- that too. Yeah. She said her sleep went yeah. to crap. Okay. That time. You're yeah. okay. So, um, Spoken like a true law student, you know, oh, stressful, but it wasn't that bad. Yeah. Let me, let me make a guess here right now. Yeah. Are you the kind of person that is like, you know, stuff gets hard. You just keep going, pushing through. Let's just keep doing this. Do people tell you, you need to take a break. You're doing too much. Is this common? So I do a lot. Like I just, I have a lot on my plate. I do a lot of extracurriculars and sports and school, but I feel like I do a good job balancing it. Like I meditate and I'm, you know, I do my yoga and I take my walks and I eat well. So I yeah. think I balance it, but it is a lot. I mean, 
Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're a little in denial. You're doing a lot. <laughs> you're, you're overstressed is what's going on. I think maps 15 for her. Yeah. hundred percent. I think map, I think maps 15 would be a, I bet a you would, program. I bet you would do amazing on maps 15. And, and then, uh, I would do mini cuts. So instead of staying in a okay. deficit exactly. for a month or two months, three months at a time, you know, run a week or two, just low calorie, and then go back to maintenance to a little surplus and then go back, especially since you also really care about building strength. Mm -hmm. So if we stay in a long, yeah, need to if we stay in a long uh, cut for an extended period of time, you're not going to see strength gains. You're going to see mm -hmm. the opposite. And so, you know, I would actually cover more around maintenance and then have these little weeks where you go in a deficit and then go back to your maintenance to a slight surplus. And so it'll allow you to still kind of build strength. You'll also kind of lean out. You're not, you don't have a time frame either. So there's no rush. Mm -hmm. This is the healthier, better, smarter way to do this. And so I would just kind of interrupt these little mini cuts with, you know, mini bulks and follow a program more like maps 15 mm -hmm. and, and be also aware of what else is going on because you're in law school, you like all this other stuff, you know, uh, pay attention to, even though it may not seem like a really, like you, you don't, you don't have to have somebody die in your family to consider it a extra or a lot more stress on your life. It could just be simply you've got a, a test you're studying for and you also did, you know, your two sports that week and you just got two bad nights of sleep and, you know, something else is on your mind. Maybe, you know, inflation's driving or you crazy. Just cumulative. Could be any, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's just a lot of little things that are compounding that that it's just a, this is a week that you take it easy on intensity. Yeah. So so uh, doctors, lawyers, high performing executives, uh, you know, they have something in common. It's a superpower, but it also could be a detriment. Now, what's the superpower? They kind of don't feel the stress like everybody else, so they just, just keep going. Bulldoze right through it. Right, but the effects are still there. You just don't necessarily feel it. So you ask somebody who's like that. Hey, do you feel like you're stressed? No, I feel. Totally fine. But if you were to like measure everything phys physiologically and really get in tune, you would see like, oh no, you're, you're under stress. You just don't, you're just not connecting to it. You don't identify it. You don't feel it, which allows you to perform at the level that you perform, but also puts you in a position where you don't know there's too much until like your hair falls out or you lose your sleep or, and I'm, I'm giving you examples of like clients that I've worked with where, why is my hair falling out? And you know? mm -hmm. so so it's it, it it's it's more than you think is what I'm trying to say. So what Adam said with the diet I love. In fact, you could even do it like this. You can be in a you can be in a deficit 5 days a week and then 2 days a week being a slight surplus over the whole week the average if you were to add them all up puts you in a slight deficit. So it's like deficit 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 maintenance surplus deficit deficit deficit. Those diet breaks tend to be less stressful on the body. Then as far as workouts are concerned, MAPS 15 is ideal. I bet you doing MAPS 15, you're going to see your body progress faster than it's doing even with MAPS anabolic. I bet you're going to see faster progress. And, and here's how you'll know. It should feel like the results you should get should feel effortless. In other words, if you do this, if you follow what we're saying and then you're like, oh my God, this is so weird. I'm getting leaner. I feel strong. It doesn't feel like, I, I, why am I getting leaner? I don't feel like I'm like killing myself. Like this doesn't feel like I'm struggling. It's because you're working with your body versus, oh my God, I'm working so hard. I'm doing everything right. Why the hell is my strength going down? Why the hell am I not getting leaner? Now you're working against your body. You know, we were just having this conversation off air and why, why we think this is so challenging for people because it's a bit count, counterintuitive, right? Everything else in your life, if you study harder and more for your law exam, you do better. You practice your sport harder and more often, you're better at your sport. Like most things that you apply more of, you get more results from. With ch body composition change, i.e. leaning out, there's a right dose. There is. Line. It doesn't work that way. It's not the more you do or the harder you work at it, the b better results you get. There is a very, there's a sweet spot. And, and that sweet spot is different for everybody and different at different times in your life. And if you're at a point in your life right now where you've got a lot on your plate, that's not necessarily a time that you can add a bunch of the the exercise that you need to do things that complement what else is going on in your yeah. life. And so it's it's tough because, like I said, it's so it's you so unique. Everything else in your life, you apply more to it and you put more effort towards it. It it pays you more return. That doesn't work that way with exercise. There, it's a there's a very 
there's a very sweet spot for what's optimal. It's a for moving your body. thing too. And, and yeah. just to add to that, here's what here's one other thing I want you to add to that. Don't judge it. So don't look at your work and be like, I'm only working out three days a week. That can't possibly be too much. If if it's not working, it's too much. If you're not getting, if all of a sudden your sleep goes to shit, you're noticing hormone imbalances, your libido goes down, your appetite all of a sudden is strange. Either you lose it or you get crazy cravings. It's too much, even if it's three days a week or two days a week. But I think based on what we're saying, I think if you just switched right now to Mass 15, um, you can even do the advanced version, to, which is 20 minutes with a barbell. Um, I bet you'll get, I bet you'll start seeing things move, move in the right direction. And then what we said with the, with your diet, you know, you, 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 you alternate between uh, a deficit and maintenance and then a surplus here and there. I bet that'll nourish you, uh, you know, just enough. The other thing I want to ask you was, was your digestion. I didn't get a, did you notice any gut issues during that time? No, I think I was, I'm generally kind of usually always bloated. Um, mm-hmm. but I think I think it was okay. I didn't notice anything drastically different. Yeah. Okay. So I, I also, I would like, like for you also to see if you can address some of the, the, the issues with bloat, because that does mean that there's some gut issues that are underlying. Now, why is that important? Because it's one more stress. Oh, under <laughs> underlying gut issues. I'm gonna tell you something right now, lean underlying gut issues, even things you've been dealing with a long time that you're like, eh, it's not that big of a deal or whatever that reduces your capacity for stress tremendously like 20%. In other words, if you fixed your gut issues, you could probably add 20% more workload to your body and be fine. So I'll recommend that you try and find yourself a functional medicine practitioner and take a look at maybe some of the underlying gut issues because that's compromising your ability to handle well, get stress. In, get in our free form. That's where I'm going to send you. So MP, uh, uh, MP Holistic Health uh, on uh, Facebook. It's a free forum. There's functional medicine practitioner on there. That you can ask questions. Doctor Cabral um, is amazing. Their yeah. whole team is Best amazing team. over there. Yeah, so that's definitely worth looking into for sure. Can I ask you? So, like, going with that, I'm not. I'm not, Of course, I agree with you, but I guess when is the right time to be going after those like tremendous gains? You when, know, like if I want to deadlift twice my body weight, how do I know? You know, is it life kind of always just different kind of stressors? Yeah, yeah, yeah but let your let your body tell you. Yeah. You're gonna know. Like you're yeah. there's like when I when I know everything's lining up nice, right? As far as like my diet, my sleep, like the way I'm taking care of my body, it lets me know on those exercises. Like you you deadlift and squat so frequently and so often, like it's very obvious to me when like I'm feeling really good. You grab that first that first set and the weight just moves and you're like, oh God. Yeah, but let me add let me add this though. Uh you're you'll get your body will adapt if you give yourself the right dose. Okay. So could you get your deadlift way up with what's going on with your life right now? Well, yeah. If you if you're training properly according to the to what your body needs, I switched to MAPS 15 and I hit a PR in a deadlift that I the, the original PR I hit in my early 30s, and I went and worked out. I was working out 25 minutes a day here in the studio, and all of a sudden it hit a PR. So it's I mean it's possible even potentially now. But what Adam said is also true. If you're at the end of law school, then you get to pass your bar, then you're going to start. And I know the first few years as you know as a lawyer is like you're just getting your ass kicked. So. You, uh, you know, it's, it's probably not going to happen in the first, over the next few years, you got other stuff going on, but if you train right, you should see your strength go up regardless. Okay, cool. Right. Uh, do you guys think the 1700 calories is like a good range for my, is, is that like, is that me with like, is that decent? I guess what kind of what you see just my five, six, one fifty. Yeah, it seems pretty typical. I mean, how do you feel eating that much? Does it feel all right? Oh, I could eat a little more. Okay. I mean, you could do a reverse diet. You could slowly do a reverse diet during this process and get those numbers up too, if you want it. Let me send you our reverse dieting guide. So you have something to, to follow. Okay. Okay. Cool. And we'll send you maps 15 too, if you don't have that. Thank you so much. You got it, Lean. Thank yep. you so much for the support. Thank you all. I appreciate you. No problem. You know how you're talking to a, uh, stress aholic or whatever <laughs> is when you mention it they they kind of smile and laugh yeah. because they think it's cool <laughs> like I think I'm fine yeah like I've had people tell me that like oh you've got two and I'll clear like yeah I do got you two wear it as a badge of honor yeah yeah you're like wait a minute that that might be a problem you know that might be an issue but yeah I, I bet you if she did math 15 and did what you said with the diet she'll so, see her, her I mean it goes right back to what we were saying off air when we we're having yeah. that conversation and you take someone like that just athlete lawyer like I mean, she, you're, you're right. Like that personality, like she's gotten to where she's at in life because she's a killer because mm-hmm. she can have some stress and mow right through it. And 
that attitude until has it stops ser- working. That right? attitude yeah. has served, served her very family, well yeah. in all other pursuits, in sports, in school. That 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 works. But when it's when you have a goal of progressing your body, body composition, hitting PRs, like that isn't body like, thrives under balance. Yeah. Yep. Totally different. Our next caller is Eric from Ohio. Eric, what's happening? How can we help you? Um, hey, uh, hey guys, I just wanted to start off to thank you. Um, all the stuff you have done a lot for me in my life the past few months that I found out with you guys. So um, going straight into the question, I've heard a few episodes from you guys recently in the past month or two, and it's talking a lot about training for different parts of your season. And so obviously there's like professionals or in high school, things of that sort of college. It's very easy when you have your season and off season, but for someone when there really isn't a off season, how do you train? Um, whether for like off season, preseason. So I, the, I'm curious for a broad sense, but also for mine. So I can go and like explain mine, but as a broad sense, how does someone do this? Well, there is no broad sense. It would be very specific to what you're doing because how much how much you're playing volleyball matters how we would program your training. So there's not really like a broad answer other than you would you would complement your training to your volleyball volume, right? So however much volleyball mm-hmm. you're playing would would dictate how much training volume would do this. So that's kind of the generic answer. The more specific one is when you tell us this is how much I play volleyball every week. And these are my goals. Mm -hmm. I want to be good at volleyball or I want to be six pack abs or I want to jump higher. Like that, that all matters. And then, then that the programming changed based on that. So why don't you tell us what it is that you want to accomplish and, and what's what your, what your schedule looks like. What is your, what is your season? Yeah. And are you competing a year round or is this like spurts of competition where it gets more intensive? Right. So we could kind of lead up to some of those, uh, bouts, but yeah, give us a little more uh, information and context. Okay. Yeah, so um, you know, Ohio obviously it gets cold. We have indoor season, and then in the summer we have sand season. So that's why there's not really much of a off season. Right. Um, so during indoor season, um, there are leagues. Um, they are high competitive leagues. So although they are for fun, um, there are semi pro players. There are many um collegiate athletes and of that source sort um and that's indoor which indoor starts around october and goes until april and then by that time it's usually warm enough we go straight into sand for me during indoor season i usually play so like the leagues two to three days a week but then also open gym which is less competition and that's purely for fun um one day a week so it's usually around anywhere from two to four days a week okay and then sand i i more play sand because indoors over not a big fan of it um so that's usually only like once a week and i still try and find um like indoor times there's very few places but we'll play indoor so eric uh so you do have an off season and an in season it sounds like so when you're mean, doing, no, he doesn't. Well, no. What I mean by that is, when you're doing sand, you're doing like one. You're doing less basket. Uh, oh. Excuse me, less volleyball than when you're playing indoor. Yes. Okay. A little so, bit less. so that's when I would do more training in the gym. So look at your entire schedule, and if you're doing less than, if you're doing less three days a week or less of volleyball, I would do one to two days a week of strength training. If it's more than three days a week of volleyball, I wouldn't do that much strength training. I would focus mostly on mobility. And that's just kind of how I would look at the whole thing. So depending on how much volleyball you're doing, that would dictate how much strength training I do that week. So if you're doing two days a week of volleyball, then I would do one day or two days a week of strength training. Does that make sense? Yeah. And okay. de- and depending on where you're at in your life and your goals, you can manipulate that. So let's say you are you know been doing this for two or three years and you're like, you know... I love playing volleyball, but I also would like to sculpt my physique a little bit more. Scale back to volleyball. 
pull back one or two days of volleyball, add, of add one or two more days of strength training. The mistake that people make uh, at your age, the, the point you're at right now, is trying to do all of it at once, yeah. thinking you're going to be this ripped, good-looking, fit, also a badass volleyball player. Something's got to give. Either you're going to be a not-so-great volleyball player but look really good on the court because you put very little time into playing volleyball and you put most of your time in the gym, or you're going to be a you know, look athletic and fit, but maybe not look like a jacked bodybuilder and really good at volleyball. And so, and trying to live in both worlds, like you, you end up suffering both, right? Versus like focus on what is more important to you right now. That's how you should prioritize your training for the week. And as that shifts through the year and over years, you just you just manipulate that. So if you're totally. And that's what I meant by early when we first started this conversation, that there isn't really like a broad generic answer other than you should you should complement your volleyball with your your strength training, not yeah. trying to get now what I meant by you you do have an off season or an in season is isn't that you stop playing. It's in the sense so the reason why there's in season training and off season training in the gym, it's it's really dictated by the intensity of their practice and their game play. That's that's what dictates the workouts. Mm -hmm. So anybody who who plays any sport, if you look at their whole year, there's periods of time when they're practicing and playing more, and there's periods of the year when they're practicing and playing less. So when when that happens, then you could do more gym time uh, versus when you're playing and practicing more, which is less gym time. So a general answer would be one full body workout a week when you're playing indoor, and when you're playing sand, two full body workouts a week. That would be general. Right. And if I, if I had more information and context, you know, there may be a way to structure in like a sort of a MAPS 15 protocol where you could do like a really low volume training just to kind of make sure that we're hitting and addressing the strength of your muscles and kind of have that complement what you're doing. But in terms of like me knowing the exact amount of volume of stress that you're placing on your body through all that, I would need to kind of be able to monitor that, figure that out, and almost have you on like an HRV kind of a setup to be able to. to well, to that, that point, Justin, uh, did you Eric, did you listen to the Corey Schlesinger episode? The yes. M the NBA coach. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, that's he, Justin's referencing like basically microdosing your training right uh, during the offseason time. So you could technically still train every day. Then th this takes more skill to do this, right? I think Sal's general advice yeah, that's is that's going to be the 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 easiest to adopt right yeah now, right is away. the easiest for the average person to apply um but you know if you wanted to get real technical and and work towards being able to train more often during in season you need to be very uh conscious of your uh intensity so you could still train but in these microdose type training sessions and reducing the intensity but that's that's takes some skill to be able to do that to know that you know, because again, you know, everybody and I love when Sal says, you know, what's uh, what you can tolerate isn't necessarily what's optimal for your body. So just because you can get through a weight training workout doesn't mean that was what was good for your body while you're also playing uh, volleyball. So learning how to if you're going to microdose training, you've got to really learn how to scale back the intensity and learn to to feel your yeah. body out. And listen you know, to if you don't have maps 15, I'm going to send that to you, Eric, because I, I bet if you just followed that while you play, whatever you pl however much you play, you'll probably progress most of the time with just yeah. that alone. That's a good Not call. the advanced blueprint, the the other the one. 15. Yeah, yeah the 15 version with the uh, suspension trainer. Yeah. I bet if you just followed that while you played, yeah. you would see yourself progress. Okay. Yeah, I, I do have that one. I haven't, I just got knee surgery about two months ago and just got fully cleared about two weeks ago. And, uh, I was in the middle of anabolic for the second time, but I bought 15 when it came out. Still have yet to try. It. Yeah. I think how, that'll be perfect. How did you yeah. blow your knee out? Uh, my quad tendon was partially torn. Oh, okay. playing, playing, volleyball. playing volleyball. Yeah. And also weight training around that same time. Yep. Yeah. 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 <laughs> education there. That that's sucks. that's why, bro. You that know, just, we gotta yeah, work on our intensity yeah, and complement it. it. Yeah. No, no. Follow Mass Fifteen. I, I, that's just do that. I think yeah. you'll be fine, regardless of how much volleyball you play, unless it's like ridiculous. I bet that'll that'll give you a pretty good consistent yeah, results the whole time. Yeah, it's good advice for sure. Okay. Yep. I guess. Uh, uh, all right. I wanted to re going back into like coming back, trying to like rebuild a base because I know it's like my vertical has dropped quite a bit. And I didn't know if retrying to build the base, as I've heard you guys mention, or 
15 might be a little bit better to go. I think 15 is going to be very appropriate. You're going to, I, th- I bet you're going to see progress the entire time. Are that. you, uh, are you already following our friends, Max Marzo and Paul Fabrits already too on Instagram? Uh, Paul Fabrits. Yes. The other one I've never heard of. Him. What was it? Max Marzo. That's his thing too, right? Isn't it? Under his name? Yeah, yeah, Max yeah, Schmarzo. M A X and then S C H M A R Z O. You got it. Thank yeah. you, Doug. Well, that's Schmar- one for 50. Schmarzo. There. Oh, that's it's made up, but it's a real name. <laughs> yeah, they so all the stuff that those guys all teach real applicable to the training and stuff that totally. you do. It's really designed to keep, you know, athletes in great condition, vertical uh, you know, multi-planar movements, like the, right. the the stuff that they put out there, force production, uh, deceleration. These are all skills that are going to uh, benefit your volleyball. So definitely follow those guys and, and take a look at the stuff they got. Yes, sir. All uh, right. Be sure to look at Max. You got right. it. Thanks, all right. man. All right. Thank you. You know, of course he fucking blew something yeah up. i know Dude, I, I knew where you were going i'm like come on adam you make the kid feel bad <laughs> well i mean I just, I we've just, all been there you know i mean shit i'm the fucking you know the 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 pot calling the kettle black here because i've <laughs> four seasons yeah. in a row <laughs> injured from but that's exactly why i got injured yeah. though is yeah. that you were doing everything i yeah and so i was and i was still so obsessed with looking a certain part but then also loved basketball so much and something did have to give my Achilles tendon, my ACL, you know, yeah, <laughs> my ankle, yeah. like shit just kept giving because I wasn't training my body according to the sport that I was trying to play. I was trying to go full throttle both and that's trying to be said. a basketball bodybuilder. Yeah. You know, it, 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 the, the challenging thing too, when you're young is you seem to have this, like your, your tolerance for stress and exercise yeah. is so high. You're very resilient. That, that the only time that you tend to realize you're overdoing it is exactly that. Well, that's why I, lo- I love when you say that. I think it's such a great way to communicate that is that what you can tolerate is not what is optimal for you because I was fine in the gym. I was yeah. fine. Like I didn't, think I was like overdoing it. I didn't feel extra stress. Yep, yep. I wasn't like achy. I felt amazing, but my body wasn't conditioned and I wasn't I wasn't managing load management on what I was trying to do on the courts. It just I was trying to be a bodybuilder who also played basketball and it's just they don't complement each other. Our next caller is Tyler from Delaware. Tyler, what's happening? How can we help you? Hey Sal, how's it going? Good man. Uh I got a pretty unique question, um, at least I think. Um, so hopefully you guys can answer it. I've been a fan. I actually got recommended to you guys while I was in a uh, form of training for one of my planes. Oh, wow, <laughs> so it's right. pretty cool to be here. Good deal. Um, but my question is, um, being a military pilot, um, comes with its challenges, obviously, but especially for fitness, um, and my kind of lifestyle flying heavy cargo planes, it's about 24 hour duty days for missions. So we can be on the road even longer. Um, missions take up to potentially two weeks. Um, it's hard to eat sometimes cause it depends if we're on base, staying off base. Um, not all the time. Do we have the efficient gym equipment? Like this last time I stayed in a so-called resort that had a 15 pound kettlebell and two five pound dumbbells. Um, so between that, um, my hectic duty day, sometimes I have to prioritize sleep, uh, because I need to be able to perform safely and fly the aircraft the next day. Um, so it's hard to find time to fit in meals, fit in a workout, especially while on the road. And then even when I get back home, cause when I get back home, I have my wife, um, and our dogs and just trying to catch up on life. So I guess just any tips that you guys could say, cause I'm tired of trying to fight the 30 plus hours sometimes that I sacrifice and get a workout in and then maybe get four hours of sleep to go on the next mission. <laughs> yeah, you got it. Well, yeah, wow. first of all, I want to thank you for your, your service, man. I appreciate you yeah, keeping, of it, keeping us free over here. All right. So here's the deal for someone like you, um, high performance, high stress, you know, there's, you, there's, you, you, there's a lot on the line with what you're doing. You got to have this mindset with your lifestyle. Everything you do has to improve the quality of your life. Okay. Whatever, regardless of that context. So if you're, and you kind of sound like you're already doing this already. So it sounds like you're already on the right track when you said, you know, I got to prioritize sleep sometimes because I got to be able to fly safely the next day. So look at exercise and diet like tools in a toolbox. And you're going to, and, and, and it's, it's, a, it's multifaceted tools. Like these tools can morph and change depending on the job that you need. So do you need recovery? Do you need mobility? Do you need stress relief? 
Do you feel lots of energy and you're going to go after it in the gym? Do you need meditation? Do you need mindfulness? That's how you dictate what the workout looks like. And that's how you dictate what the diet looks like. So diet would be like that as well. Like, okay, um, I'm feeling undernourished. I think I need more energy. So I'm going to eat some more food or my digestion's off. I think I need more fiber or I need more well-cooked vegetables or I notice my recovery's a little low. Let me increase my protein or I notice I'm sharper when I drop my carbohydrates and I increase my fat intake and I need to be sharper at the moment. Look at diet and exercise like that. And you're going to have, because of your lifestyle, you're going to have to modify and manipulate those pretty regularly versus the average person we work with. Mm -hmm. The average person we work with they know what their day looks like every single day, nine to five, whatever. Here's my schedule. Here's what it looks like. Everything's very predictable. And then I can give very general, well, here's your workout. Here's your diet. Do that. But because yours changes so much, if you were my client, I would have you, I would be in contact with you pretty regularly. Hey, Sal, here's what's going on. I'd be like, well, how do you feel? Yeah. All right. Well, this is what I want you to do with your workout. And it would look very different than maybe what I gave you the week before. So I, okay. I you know, that's unfortunately the best answer I can give you because I could, I can, I'm going to send you maps 15 yeah. if you don't already have it. Just I was just, so I was thinking maps suspension. So I was yeah. thinking maps 15, uh, map suspension and maybe like anywhere prime pro is like these all in your arsenal and then using the advice that you're giving him right now, yeah. which is like, yep. you know, pick from those based off of one, what do you have access to? So if you're in a place where you're like, you made the comment about the kettlebells and the five pound, I mean, great place for it to have a suspension trainer workout, yeah, just like, throw it up get a suspension trainer. Maybe it's one of these days where it's like hardly any sleep. You didn't, and you're overly stressed, didn't mobility get a lot of food, day. mobility day. So then you do all prime pro type of stuff. And so, you know, you're, you're making your, you're not following like one of our programs traditionally, like most people would, you're literally picking and choosing from from the arsenal of workouts that we have based off of what's going on in in your life. Yeah, what you need, how you feel, what's going on type of deal. Okay. Does that does that yeah, make sense? This is challenge. Yeah, no. I think that makes a lot of sense. I've been I mean, I've been working out since I've been in high school. Um like starting off freshman year, my dad kind of helped me it helped me go along the way and then same thing with sports and then, you know, you have like fitness advice for the military and their own kind of training. But I've also just done some research and love listening to you guys and taking advice from um, you and your podcast. But also on top of that, um, for the diet side as well, um, not just the fitness, I think that's probably also been my hardest struggle as well lately because I've tried to been doing like calorie surplus lately to just gain some size because that's always been a struggle for me uh, but like like i said being out on the road and the limited options sometimes it's hard to kind of find that so diet and one of, one of the hardest things about having um a body composition goal at this at the stage of your life that you're in right now is it's just mm -hmm. It'll get interrupted so much. Yeah, it's just not ideal. Like, I mean, sure. uh, it's it's and it's not to say that you can't potentially build some muscle or get stronger during all this stuff. I'm not saying that. Mm -hmm. But when you have somebody who's like, hey, I want Adam, I want to add 15 pounds of muscle. Like, I would never want to try and do that while also complimenting everything you got going on with work. Like, it's just yeah. something's got to give. And what you do for a living is far more important than you having 10 more pounds of muscle on your body. I, as, as a coach, if you were my coach or my friend or client or whatever, I would just tell you, like, listen, right now I want you to be – I mean, you're a fit guy, I can tell. Like, you're already in really great shape, bro. So and and so this that. this idea of you want another five or ten pounds of muscle that's your own shit like you're you're you're, <laughs> you're in, you know what I'm saying like just keeping it real I mean that's like you don't need yeah, no that makes sense you don't need fucking ten more pounds of muscle on you you're a very you, I could tell by the video you're a very fit guy so your training your diet it should 100 percent at this point of your life where you're at complement that and then there's going to be a time there's going to be a period in your life where it, it gets better and easier and more balanced and then that would be the time i'd say yo bro yeah. remember that 15 pounds we wanted to put on like let's get it like yeah. this is a time to dial the diet in be hit that surplus like crazy add the volume in the training but gotcha. right now i, yeah. I think it's a uh, time to be a little more balanced you know Ty, Ty, give yeah. me tyler do you have an idea of what kind of eating gives you the best mental sharpness what gives you the best strength and stamina what gives you the best, uh, like what makes Recovery. you feel the least inflamed, yeah. by the way, it's not probably not going to be all the same. It's probably different ways of eating for all three of those. So the reason why I'm asking that is if you don't know that start to figure that out for yourself and then okay. you can use diet, uh, is really effective way mm -hmm. to optimize performance when those, when, when the context changes, like for, so I'll give you an example for myself, 
my mental sharpness is best when I do fasting and a keto style diet. This may not be true for you. So I'm not giving this as okay. advice. This is just for me, right? So when I travel to do podcasts, which I'll do sometimes for, for, for the show, I'll travel to LA or other places and I'm doing podcasts all day. I'm eating, I'm usually fasting quite often and I'm eating a, a, a ketogenic style diet so I could be the best on the podcast. That's not the best performance diet for me though. If I want to be strong in the gym and get the best pumps, fasting and keto is not it. So when I'm here and everything's stable and I'm like, I want to get strong, then I'll eat in a surplus and I'll eat carbohydrates and I'll eat starchy foods to boost that for myself. When I notice my gut is off, mm -hmm. I also have a diet that's a little different. When my inflammation is high and I notice kind of just general stiffness, then my diet also changes. So if you can identify that for yourself and then you can look ahead and be like, I'm going on a mission and I'm going to be up all night flying this plane and I feel best when I eat this particular way for that particular style of performance, then you can lead up to it and eat in that particular way versus, okay. oh, no, when I'm home, I got, look, I'm going to be at home for the next three weeks. I'm going to have a, a regular schedule. I think I want to get, you know, focus yeah. on strength. I'm going to eat this way. And so, I'm, yeah, ahead. I'm sure that like access to quality foods, that's, that's always going to be a challenge. Right. And, and this is just something that, uh, you know, as you know, your options are limited, you know, supplementation at this point, I think in your situation would make sense. And, and to be able to kind of okay. preemptively look into that in terms of like quality protein you can bring with you in whatever form that is, um, you know, making sure like if it's, if, if you do better on like a ketogenic diet, like being able to have things accessible for that too, um, you know, supplement wise. So I would, I would, you know, in terms of like in your specific situation, I think even more so it makes sense to like have some of those yeah. options available. I'm, I'm assuming when you're on mission and you're doing, you know, multiple days and you wrote up here 16 to 24 hours minimum that you probably aren't eating a lot anyway. You're probably doing a lot of fasting. Is that, is that true? You do forget to eat every once in a while because um, <laughs> we're in the plane doing stuff, especially when we fly across the ocean. Uh, there's a good amount of lull time, but there's also checklists that we have to do in order to stay safe because there's little control out there. Um, and then it gets way hectic when you get close to the field. Um, okay. So it's kind of like the beginning and the end are the most hectic and the middle is like somewhat. But um, we have this tiny little oven in the back of the jet that I'll try and make food ahead of time. But then when we're on the road, it's harder to continue eating those meals. Like I said, you forget every once in a while. So yes, it's, it's hard. And sometimes I don't eat and fast a little, I guess. Do you notice, thinking. do you notice any changes in perform? Do you perform better for that particular type of performance better or worse when you fast? Uh, or, or I think no actually a little worse. I think okay. the food helps uh, to supply some energy to me. And then also just keeps me up. Um, even drinking water, um, staying hydrated to have mm -hmm. to even get up and go to the bathroom. Um, just keeps me in the game and in the zone a little more than if I forget to eat um, or something stressful happens. Okay. So, so then, then I would totally plan for that. And it sounds to me like ready to eat snacky type foods, uh, like nuts, beef jerky, beef jerky, jerky yeah. uh, sardines. If you have actually, you know, I don't know if that, that would work on a plan. I don't know if you're, if you're flying by yourself <laughs> yeah. or someone else, if that <laughs> would piss them off. You, but you know, stuff like that might, might be kind of a good idea um, while you're on the plane. And also with water, do you put uh, electrolytes or sodium or salt in your water? Because I think that it would help a lot a as well. I, I haven't yet. I oh. can I can definitely try that out, Tyler. Yeah, unless yeah. unless you're eating lots of the the I know I know I've worked with some people in the military and the foods they give you guys is already high as hell in sodium. But if you're eating low sodium stuff, put some some electrolyte powder in your water. We work with LMNT. That's a great option. Put it in your water, yeah. and um, that'll give you more energy. If you're, if you're, uh, if your sodium is low, otherwise just out of curiosity, Tyler has, uh, has peptides made it to you guys. You guys have a lot of buddies that mess around with peptides. Have you at all? I personally haven't heard of that. Oh, okay. Interesting. Did they you might be, did, they might that? not be allowed to. Why? Are you, what? The air force? Well, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what the L listen to the, did you listen to the episode with Dr. That. Seed that we just did? Dr. Seeds. Yeah. I, I have not I actually just got back. I was trying to talk with you guys last week. I just got back from Spain and I was pretty busy over there. Uh, oh, yeah, okay. dude. So if you get a chance, listen to that episode. And then, uh, okay. and if you have questions, you can get, we have a, a website, uh, mphormones.com and you can get a consult in there. I'm, pr I'm pretty sure they're okay to have peptides, but just something for you to look into. Check it out. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I just wrote it down. I've been jotting down notes the whole time, but yeah, I'll, some, uh, I'll check some. it out and I'll, Make sure to ask our flight doc too. Yeah, they got some nootropic uh, ones that might be interesting. That's great right. ones. I yeah. know that's what. But I know that I think the military also gives them 
That's why I asked. I was Mod- asking. Modafinil. I thought maybe like you guys were, they were already like giving them to them. Mm. So if they're, I mean, I'm just curious. So you check it out. One, obviously yes. find out, make sure it's fine, but I, which I think it is okay. And then there's awesome. some things in there that I think you might yeah. have see some, some benefits from. Yeah. But we'll say, we'll send you maps 15 minutes. So you got that. All right. Awesome. I appreciate that. And then, so basically in a nutshell, just diet for energy during the flight and then what I can on the road and then just constantly adapting the workouts. Constantly. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yep. All right, man. Thanks, awesome. Tyler. Well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you guys so much for the advice. I love your show. love watching you and I'll look forward to seeing more. You awesome. got it, brother. Thanks, right Tyler. On. Thank you. That's rough, man. Day, like, you know, 24 hours, you know, days in a row, Dude. flying a plane. Oh. I'm sure he forgets to eat all the time. Oh, bro. That, yeah. that would be so brutal. Well, right away, I thought about the the, the Dihexa and the C-Max and all the stuff. Oh, that, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like, I would but just I, keep I want, them sharp and alert. But I wonder, I think that, that they give them that, that's what I thought. modafinil. Well, that's I think why that's I asked him. Fight, yeah. I, I thought maybe they would already be giving it to him. Mm-hmm. So I wonder if or maybe fighter even, pilots. Or, but, yeah, know. or maybe even uh, like Adderall or something like that, methamphetamines that might even be prescribed. At certain times, it's really interesting. Yeah. But yeah, that you know, it, that's a, such a obviously when we give advice on the podcast, we're talking to most people. Yeah. A situation like that, it's that's very when you, unique. Yeah, your your workouts are changing all the time. You, you can't follow a program. You know why this is challenging? I mean, he's a young guy and he wants to put on fifteen of pounds of muscle. And the <laughs> truth is, it's just like where he's at yeah. in his life and what he does is like so much more important than five or 10 more pounds yeah. of muscle. And plus, if he tries to put on five, 15 pounds while he's doing all that, it's yeah. just not going to happen. And the truth is, he just actually his wheels. he might get what he wants by actually following what we're saying. So you right. you might see the body respond That's and right. you get you actually build some muscle during that process. But I mean, the dude looks phenomenal, yeah, right? You can tell he's shape. already in great shape already. So That's it. Look, if you like our podcast, you'll love mindpumpfree.com. Go check it out. Got lots of free guides that can help you with any health or fitness goal. You can also find us all on social media. Instagram, Justin is found at Mind Pump Justin. Adam is found at Mind Pump Adam. And you can find me at Mind Pump DiStefano on Instagram. Today, we're going to teach you everything you need to know to build a strong, well-developed chest. When I think of weak points and and areas that I struggled with developing for a a really long time, chest was up there with the- Yeah, it was for me. It was for me for sure. I got more caught up in the weight I could lift versus how I was developing my body. I think it's one of the most challenging muscles to develop for most people because the form and technique. 